Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. During World War II, the U.S. Navy expanded to a really unprecedented size. There was no doctrine for controlling this type of force, and so new technology was developed to help. One of the things that supported tactical operations of ships operating together was called TBS, or Talk Between Ship. It's a type of radar, it's a type of radio communication that was considerably faster to send, receive, decode, uh, and it made communication of ships, especially in tactical situations during engagements, uh, much easier to uh, communicate with each other. Ships almost always operate too far apart for voice-to-voice -voice communication. There's certainly the, the like megaphone things that when you're sailing right alongside another one for underway replenishment. But going all the way back to the ancient world uh, where you've got galleys ramming into each other, flags would have been used to signal. The problem is everybody in the engagement can see the flags. So you have to have coded systems for signal flag communications so that uh, Ptolemy's fleet can't figure out what uh, Cassander's fleet is signaling each other. This continues all the way through the Age of Sail, and even during the Battle of Jutland in 1916, you've got these huge fleets of dreadnought-type battleships, each operating close to a half a mile from the next one in line, sending signal flag communications back and forth. Radio has come about by this time. The problem is, when you transmit over radio, even when you transmit an encoded signal that the enemy can't read, you're still telegraphing your position because that signal's point of origin can be triangulated and you can figure out where the enemy is. And if you've got uh, one object that's sending a lot of signals as it's moving, you can guess that that's probably the enemy flagship or the center of the enemy fleet, and you can guess where this enemy fleet is, which makes interception much easier. During the interwar period, cathode ray tube technology and radio technology uh, is, is getting smaller and we're understanding the electromagnetic spectrum a lot better and so there are developments in this field that allow for new types of antennas and uh, transmitters and receivers that operate at completely different frequency sets than had previously been used. Traditional forms of radio were low frequency and high frequency. That relates to the wavelength of the transmission that you're putting out. And typically, low frequency uh, transmissions have pretty good range because it, it's a relatively small, or it's a relatively large difference between the wavelengths, so it's able to transmit over long periods. High frequency has pretty decent range as well because um, just because of how the uh, wavelengths operate, you can bounce it off of the ionosphere and then so it bounces up and then back down and you can get to the other side of the planet with that under the right conditions. The problem is atmospheric conditions aren't standard and you never know how far one of those high frequency transmissions is going to bounce. Uh, so you may send it to somebody comparatively close and they don't get it. Uh, you may not want somebody really far away to hear it and it might make it to them and they're able to decode it. Uh, so, high frequency was a little bit problematic. Right at the beginning of World War II, the U.S. Navy starts to use very high frequency. Very creative at naming things. And it's a much higher frequency sound wave, which means that it's uh, going to dissipate a lot quicker, usually before it makes it to the ionosphere to bounce to go any further. So because these messages are being transmitted over a much shorter period, it means that it is less likely that it will make it far enough for an enemy radio station to be able to pick it up, uh, decode it, triangulate your position. It's perfect for a single fleet of ships operating together. What's more is it is voice-to-voice -voice communication. You can basically pick up a handset and send a message as opposed to having to key something on a mill or uh, on a teletype where th there's a really long gap between when you say, I want to send this message, it gets sent down to the radio room, like this World War II era radio room on USS New Jersey, we're seven stories away from the bridge, it gets coded, it gets transmitted, it 
hopefully gets picked up by the radio room of the place that you want it to go to. They decode it, and then they get it up to the bridge of their ship. The admiral reads it, and then he figures out what he's going to do. So th th there's a lot of lag time here. Maybe not as much as in the old day of signal flags, but it's still not ideal for tactical situations when you realize you're in the middle of a night fight and you've been firing at your own ships and you need everybody to cease fire, or the, you realize that the Japanese are actually in two forces and they're coming at you from two directions instead of one, uh, you need to make these tactical changes quickly. And so that's where TBS really excels. It's not a perfect system and it does get superseded post-World War II, but during World War II it was one of those key technologies that allowed an expanding fleet to start operating together more effectively with multiple different task groups, especially given that a lot of the guys in charge of these fleets and task forces have had a lot of recent promotions. The Navy has massively expanded in personnel as well as ships, so maybe they don't have the 20 years of peacetime experience that uh, the folks who went into the war with had. The biggest problem with TBS probably is that it is so easy and effective to use that everybody gets on the radio and talks. And so the U.S. Navy has to start developing doctrine to have different circuits so that everybody isn't talking on the same frequency and uh, to have, like, okay, you only talk during this one situation. You, it, it's like when you give kids walkie-talkies and they're just all squelching over each other. So that, that was something early on that the Navy had to develop its doctrine once this new technology was introduced. We're in the battleship's World War II era radio room where most of this equipment works or is in the process of being made to work by our radio club volunteers. If you come out on Saturdays, you might see somebody in this space operating. They primarily use uh, high frequency uh, Morse code as opposed to talk between ship, but you still get to watch how this original World War II era equipment works. Have you ever used radios or walkie talkies before? Let us know what your experience was like in the comments section down below. I've never had particularly good luck with walkie-talkies and transmitting and the people I wanted hearing it to be able to hear it. I also work inside of a steel box that doesn't uh, propagate radio signals very well. So your experiences may differ. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to donate to support the museum. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find about us and the channel. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Ian Foley, and I'm a life scout of Troop 29. And I'm here today with Ryan Tomanski, the curator of the Battleship New Jersey. And I've just dropped off my Eagle Project, which is five of these great benches here. So we have a GoFundMe in the description. And the first 10 people who donate $200 can get a custom 